Good morning and welcome to the latest edition of Morning Learnings. I'm really grateful to be joined this morning by Hugh Chappell, who is a serial um, investor and massive entrepreneur as well. And I'm really grateful for your time this morning, Hugh. You were kindly recommended by Lara Morgan. I know you and Lara are on the entrepreneurial committee. That's where you met. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. Grateful for your time. So um, tell me a bit about yourself to let the audience know. Who is Hugh Chappell? How long have you been around? And I know you've been doing a few bits and pieces. So um, please share with us. Yeah, and good morning, uh, Stephen. And, you know, thank you for the opportunity to speak to yourself and obviously to your um, to your listeners. So it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, you mentioned Lara Morgan. She's a great entrepreneur. Um, and, uh, yep, I thank her for the introduction as well. Um, yeah, it's a difficult one how to explain myself because, um, I'm no longer 21. I wish I was, uh, I'm now in my early sixties and, um, my career spans, um, um, you know, several decades. So it, it's never easy to explain who you are or what you are, but I, I kind of break my career down into, um, sort of a few the petitions and i think you know the first petition for me was actually as um as an employee um i worked for a FTSE 100 company called johnson matty um and i worked as a um i worked in a mainframe department for those old enough to remember big mainframe computers icl ibm and and so on but my break i think my big break came in um 79 because whilst working at johnson matty i um had the pleasure of working with a number of programmers who were quite into um uh, so-called microcomputers at the time, uh, personal computers, and um, playing with a few personal computers from various manufacturers uh, really opened my eyes as to what I thought the future might be in computing, uh, bear in mind we had just mainframes. So um, it's a long story, and we don't have time now, but I joined um, Apple 1979. Uh, Apple was setting up in the UK, and, um, you know, what an honor, because at the time, Apple was 200 and 26 employees worldwide. And their turnover for that year, if you check back, was around about $20 million. So if you take $20 million, the pound was a lot stronger in those days, nearly double what it is today. So you had a turnover of less than um, 10 million pounds per annum. Can you imagine Apple less than 10 million pounds per annum? Anyway, you know, it, it's, it's a great story because at the time Apple had one product, a personal computer called the Apple II um, and Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak introduced this product and um, it was a very, very successful product. So I was very lucky to um, you know, work with a very small group of people in the UK, 12 of us when we started. And my boss reported through to um, Steve Jobs. And um, yeah, what an honor to work with Apple. But I should say that Apple had a lot of struggles at, in that time. Um, the Apple II was a huge success. Apple III was, wasn't a success. Uh, Apple Lisa also was not a success. When Apple Macintosh came in, we weren't really sure what to do with it, to be honest. So it's an interesting time. And for those of people that follow Apple or know about Apple, as most of us do, you know, Steve Jobs end up actually getting fired from the company. And um, uh, so that's that's an interesting time. So um, we've got this period of Apple. Uh, but for me, the big spark was to to work in a business that was disruptive. We were doing something new and we were doing something different. Um, you know, can you imagine a world of typewriters versus word processing today? Can you imagine a world of pen, paper, and calculator versus a spreadsheet? And what we did at Apple was um, we introduced personal computers to small business, and we showed them, rather than using a typewriter, uh, word processing. And we showed them a spreadsheet, which was called VisiCalc. It's uh, the first electronic spreadsheet for a personal uh, computer, before Lotus 1, 2, 3, and certainly well before Microsoft um, Excel. So uh, great time, but at the same time, we're selling products, uh, an Apple II with a couple of disk drives, a screen, a printer, and some software. In those days was 2,500 pounds. I bought my first house, 1980, for 26,000 pounds. That today would be over 300. Um, so we're, we're kind of selling computers at two and a half thousand. In real terms, today it's like selling a product for 25,000 pounds. But I'll tell you something, guys, you take away your iPhone today, you take away your spreadsheet, you take away your word processing, all the other things that we take 
for granted with these devices. And I'll tell you something, you probably would spend, if you had the money, £25,000 um, to do it. And in those days, we certainly had plenty of people that wanted to do that. This is the start of my career. I'll try to go through very quickly now. Um, Apple was an interesting time. Um, I had an opportunity whilst I was in Japan. I got approached by uh, a company that was selling screens to Apple. Originally, Apple did not have their own screens, um, and we were selling a third-party brand. That company wanted to introduce their own brand around the world, and um, a Japanese electronics company called Cargo Electronics. And I was in Japan. They essentially said, come and join us. I, well, I don't want to join. I'm happy where I am. And it's, well, you show us what you're earning, we'll double it. And when you're young, you're in the 20s, and someone says, show us what you earn and we'll double it, you listen to it, people, I promise you. So I set up a company called Taxan. Again, if you're young, you won't know us. But in the 80s and 90s, I built a business from zero to over 50 million pounds of turnover per annum. Um, very, very successful market leader in third-party displays. And by then, we had the IBM market and all of the compatibles that we know from Hewlett-Packard and Dell. And there's so many stories about each one of those companies that another day we can, we can talk about. Um, but that, again, is interesting because work for Americans, now working for Japanese, um, and again, seeing the difference between how people work, traveling around the world, what a great life. But I'll tell you something, one thing I always wanted to do, and this is the pivotal point, I always wanted to work for myself. I always wanted to have my own business. But I've got to say, I never had the courage initially. From when I started work to 2003, I worked for other people. Two jobs from 79 to 2003, which I've just been through. Um, but, but I had this moment. I was on a plane, Boxing Day, heading to Japan, turn of the millennium. And um, I just thought, I've seen all of these people starting their own business. Some you know who are massively famous and lots and lots of people you never heard of who built brilliant businesses. And it was very exciting for me in 2003 to actually start my first business with my own money. And, and I founded a business called uh, Trusted Reviews. And uh, Trusted Reviews was a very simple concept. It took the concept of a computer magazine, but rather than, in, in other words, publishing um, uh, reviews and news and features and all of these things, but the disruption was, rather than chopping down trees and publishing on paper, we published online, and we were one of the first to do that properly. And Trusted Reviews was very, very successful. And can you believe, four years later, I sold my business to Time Warner, the largest media company in the world, American company who owned IPC Media in the UK, who had 200 magazines, Horse and Hound, Country Live, Angler's Mail, you name it. Um, and they recognized digital, and they bought me because my business had huge audience, but also it was very profitable business. So it just wasn't one of these businesses that attracted lots of people. It also made a lot of money. And uh, big companies like that will come for you um, if you do something like that. I had a second business called BitTech, which I sold for Dennis Publishing. And it's funny, I had these two very successful businesses, sold them both for cash, got into a position where I was very lucky. If I didn't want to work again, I didn't have to. But the thing is, when you're a bit of a workaholic, um, I've never taken drugs or anything like that. But I can imagine if you're a drug addict, it must be very difficult to come off it. I think work is a similar thing for me. Uh, you know, find a job you like and you never work a day in your life. This has been my sort of guidance. And I absolutely loved everything that I did. And so for me, having sold both businesses, and having financial stability and all of that, I decided to, uh, to do what I've done for the last 15 years. I've done three things. Um, I've um, invested in startups and I've been very lucky to work with some amazing people. Um, and on my LinkedIn profile, if you key my name and you'll see who I've done, but in no particular order, you know, um, one I'm very excited about is uh, Lad Bible, which uh, most young people will know. It floated on the uh, stock market December with a 360 million valuation. Very proud to have met the founders of Lad Bible um, in 2014. There was about a dozen of them, and I worked in the cockpit with them to help them develop the business. And it's a tremendous um, story. And again, working with highly talented, hardworking uh, young people. Absolute honor to work with Mad Bible. But again, through the list from Just Park to Parker Peter to Lovestruck uh, to Cloudship, another very successful business, um, to uh, My Voucher Codes and so on, I've been incredibly lucky to work with some great people. So working with people, helping them develop their business. I've been fortunate. I've been approached by a few people who said, can you help us develop our business? And I've done a small number of those. I don't want to be a serial sort of non-exec. I've done some work and worked with some iconic brands like Time Out, Dennis Publishing, for example. That's been great fun. And I've given a lot of time back, worked with lots of entrepreneurial groups. So there you go. It's not easy in 10 minutes to uh, <laughs> a lifetime, which has been amazing. Each one of those is a story you could spend. I could, I could spend hours on Lab Bible, hours on Apple, hours on 
you know, my own businesses, etc. But uh, this this has been my career. In summary, I have worked with some highly talented individuals, and and I've learned so much working with them. So the good thing about me is that I guess my equation is work hard. Harder you work, lucky you are. Work with great people. Um, and I, I would like to think when I was younger, I did listen. I'm not a brilliant listener. I wouldn't, wouldn't give myself 100, you know, out of 100. But often people might think I'm not listening. But when I'm sleeping or when I'm on my own, or I'm, you know, one of my hobbies is fishing, I'm thinking. And I know when I'm thinking what I'm doing. And I, I am analysing what I've read and learned and who I've worked with. And, and I learn from that process. There you go, Steve. I hope that wasn't too detailed. I hope I haven't bored anybody with that sort of pricey of my uh, of my working career. No, but you've given um, loads of great questions to ask you now to go through all of that. So just on your last part about um, you've worked with highly talented individuals, what do you think makes them highly talented? What are the skills for people that are watching this, whether they're just starting in their in their career? or whether you know you and I had a discussion beforehand that you're still learning and every day is a learning day. What yeah. do you think the qualities are of highly talented people that anybody watching this and listening can actually you know, start today if they needed to? Yeah, you know, I have to say hard work. You know, I, I said earlier, the harder you work, the luckier you are. Now, some people, um, my sister, for example, would say, if you can't get your job done in the hours of nine to five, you're not very good. And... You know, she has a different way of thinking. Um, I'm not saying my sister's right, or I'm not saying my sister's wrong. You know, she has a, a nice lifestyle. She works a certain way. Um, mine has always been, I found that by working harder, I got more things done. And back in my early days as a salesman, you know, I remember in my days at, at Apple, Friday, some people by two o'clock, three o'clock were winding down, getting ready to go to the pub. You know, and I'd still be seeing customers at six, six o'clock, whatever. Maybe I go back to the office. In those days, we didn't have email, so I'd do my quotes, I'd post them. So I'm on the phone Monday, and I'm closing those quotes, whereas uh, other people are coming to work Monday, and they're sending their quotes out. So I think hard work, nothing beats hard work. You look at lots of highly successful entrepreneurs. We can, we can take Steve Jobs as an example. That guy worked 24-7. It's all he thought about. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but part of the reason for the success is a total... Uh, focus and dedication to the mission. So myself, I lived and breathed, you know, my work 24-7, but I loved what I did. It was, it's, it's like a hobby. It's not like I'm, I'm not stressed. Well, I'm just, of course, you're stressed in business. There's stress, I appreciate. But, but the point is, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, there are ups and downs and lefts and rights. But I think hard, hard work is one. I think the other one is talent, you know, work with talented people. And also, think about what your culture is. So, for example, people who work with me, like I said, I probably couldn't work with my sister because we have a different thinking on, you know, how to get things done. And it's not to say she's wrong, but it, it wouldn't make sense to be all the time at crossroads in, in, in thinking. So, you know, I think if, if you've got a culture like mine where you're focused, you're working hard, you're thinking it, myself, my leadership team, I want them, I want to be synergy. It's not about yes, Hugh, no, Hugh, not at all, but it is definitely working with people where you've got a commonality of thinking and you're all pointing in the same direction because there's nothing worse than when everyone's coming at things in different directions. And I think if you look at look at the United Kingdom right now, you look at how the country's run, you can see that all day long people are just split arguing and uh, as a result, you know, nothing ever gets done. And um, so, you know, I think in business, um, it's good to make sure that that team. So I think that's good. I think honesty is also something and trust. Uh, I've been very lucky. A lot of my business has been B2B, where you're selling to the same people over and over again. And it's brilliant fun to, you know, business is about win-win. It's got to delight the customer, but it's got to be good for the business as well. But I don't want to do business that's not good for my business and my staff. You know, I want to, I want to sell products. I want to make profit. And I want to be proud of that. But at the same time, I want delighted customers. There's a balance there, isn't there? And getting that right. And um, so I think trust, ethics as well, um, being honourable, um, you know, it's a bit like customers. Sometimes you get customers that are not happy. But, you know, I know when I used to, with my own customers, I always used to say to them, look, you know, this is my mobile number. You can call me 24-7. If, if there's something urgent, you call me. I'd prefer if you didn't ring me on a three o'clock on a Sunday. But you know what? Because I like to sleep. But I'll tell you something. 
and just people knowing that you're there and you're available to them. I think a lot of buyers and um, you know customers they they like that. So in B two B, there are things that you can do um, that can really build great relationships with customers long term, um, and also consultancy selling as well because it's a bit like Apple. You go back to that day of you know someone's using a typewriter and trying to show them. You know we know it now, but at the time showing them the benefits. So any business that I've worked for. You know, um, I, I invested in one called parkatmyhouse.com. I think everyone knows what that means, parkatmyhouse.com. Marketplace, and um, you've got people want to park a car, people with spaces. And and it, it's great fun when you look at space owner is, is making money and they're very happy. And as a driver, you know, parking in a driveway is so, is so fantastic. And uh, it's, it's great when you've got a great product. It's great when you passionately believe in it. I don't know if I've, I've probably gone a bit off piece there, but anyway, there's a <laughs> yeah, question. I hope that um, uh, thank you asking me originally. Sorry, that's all right. You just um, keep on getting me more questions to ask you. But actually, a couple of questions that have come in. One about Steve Steve Jobs. So, what was it like working with Steve Jobs, and what did you learn from him? Yeah, well, I have to be clear. I didn't work for Steve Jobs. I worked in the UK. The UK was set up. My boss. He worked for Steve Jobs. I did meet Steve Jobs. I just remember at the time, you know, we were all wearing suits in the 70s. You know, um, I, I was in sales um, and we, we were all immaculately dressed. And here's a guy that's wearing jeans. And here's a guy with, let's say, longer hair and whatever. So I just remember it was my first introduction to a different way. I think the think different or whatever the uh, slogans that have been used. But this is the bit that I remember. And I also remember there'd be socks on, which at the time was quite unusual. Now, today, we don't think about not wearing a suit or a tie. Even this morning, I thought, what should I put on, you know? So I put a white shirt on this morning um, to try and look a bit more professional and whatever. But hey, you know, nowadays, um, we don't need to wear a white shirt, do we, anymore? Um, things have moved on from that. I think it was more the energy that came from Apple um, with their products and... and um, and, and their thinking, which was which which gravitated not just from Jobs, by the way, because I think a lot of people miss out here on, on Steve Wozniak. You know, Steve Wozniak is the guy. Fifty fifty Wozniak and Jobs, and Wozniak is the guy that built the Apple II, which was a brilliant product. Um, and whilst it's a one plus one is three, and of course Steve Jobs in product and marketing and you know customer facing, a tremendous, tremendous. Um, my bit that I still remember is you know Wozniak and there were things that went wrong with Apple with Apple 3 um for example and um you know these were mistakes that were made but I think Jobs would say you know you know I think when you're when you're inventing when you're doing new things you, you can't get everything right and sometimes it, it takes that step to that step and eventually you get it right as Apple have done you know Apple have got everything right and Steve Jobs has to take the credit and all the people that have worked in that business to get them to that. My, my time was a time when Apple was struggling um, and it was sad to see some mistakes being made. For example, Apple III, um, you know, one of the things that Steve Jobs will not accept was a fan. So at the time, um, when IBM launched their personal computer in 1981, the IBM PC, the IBM personal computer, had a fan in it. Jobs would not have a fan in the Apple III. So the Apple III, if ever you get a chance to look at it, the last ones went to landfill, by the way. But the Apple III was a great concept. I totally got it. But there were problems like um, heat. So, for example, at the back of an Apple III, it looked a little bit like a, a, a household radiator with the fins at the back. Those fins, as you know, dissipate heat. Um, but guess what? Apple III had some uh, heating problems, overheating. So... We had some reliability issues and, and some other things as well. Um, so your question on jobs for me, my memories are very much seeing him, meeting him. Um, to me, it was the magic of, the, of, of what he stood for and, and, and also what Steve uh, Wozniak stood for as well. Uh, there was a third guy called Ronald Wayne, if you look him up, but uh, he was only there a couple of weeks. And um, that's an interesting story as well. But he was a, one of the original founders. 
So there's loads of lessons, you know, in business. People have failures um, and a lot of people can't get over their failures. So how, you know, again, can you learn from your failures? I mean, you know, yeah. from what I see, every, you know, every business does have failures. Every business does make mistakes. Some people take it to heart and can't lose it and can't get over it. So again, can you give some tips about rejection and mistakes and sure. how to get over them, please? Yeah, I mean, there's a saying on failure, you know, which is you only fail when you give up. So something to think about in that statement, you only fail when you give up. Um, you know, failure is life, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, I remember when I went to school at sport, you know, it was about winning. You know, we were kind of educated, mentored, pushed to win. Um, I played um, rugby and to a, for the first team throughout my school days. Very tough game, rugby. Um, you've got steel studs and you've got people climbing all over each other and whatever. Um, but um, there, was a, there was a culture to win. But sometimes you, you lost. But at the end of the match, you would shake hands um, and you go away and think about it and learn from that particular match and keep thinking about how one can win. But life, you know, again, it's when we're younger... We go out to a nightclub, we ask a girl to dance as an example, and she says no. Well, you know, okay, that's her loss, isn't it, you could argue. Uh, you know, um, so I'm, I'm thinking that in life you do get rejection. You go for an interview and you don't get the job. And I think we, in, in, in life we have to learn that we can't, you know, always get things the way we want. So in business, um, of course, you know, start up doing new things, we know there's a lot of risk involved, not just for the people that are starting those businesses, but also investors. And, you know, you look at 10 startups, we know the majority fail. We know that. So the first thing is, if you do start something and it doesn't work out, well, actually, you're in the majority anyway. So sometimes things will go wrong. And that can be all the way through to a, a wind up and, and, a, and a closing down of the business. That happens year in, year out, these things are happening. Also, sometimes businesses fail, not through the fault of the business. You know, we, we can see at the moment, there are some tremendous challenges in the economy right now with higher interest rates, energy costs, and so on. And I'm afraid the reality which we have to accept is that some businesses will not be able to survive the impact of recession, and I, I hate using that word, and I'm sorry to use a negative word, um, but, but the reality is that can happen. So the, the Americans would say, and I think I met the founder of Wikipedia once, he, he said, failure is good. I remember he said, failure is good. And you know what? We kind of think failure is not good, but failure is good because we learn something from it, don't we? And I think, you know, I come here today being very positive. I promise you something, I could spend a lot of time telling you, you know, like trusted reviews when I started that, what the hell have I done? I've given up this fantastic job. I've started a business, I'm just losing money. Um, and, you know, I used to go home at night and I'd, I'd say to my wife, you know, what have I done, you know? And I think that moment, those, those thinkings are absolutely normal in, in the world of um, startup. And not just startup, even scale can be particularly challenging. So I think failure, it's an interesting word. One has to see what the positives of failure can be. The other thing on failure is sometimes people say fail quick. You know, I, I advise businesses sometimes and I go into businesses that are struggling. And sometimes when you come from the outside and you look into a business, you think, you know, you see things that other people don't see. And uh, people who genuinely want help, it might be that, look, going to have to make some pretty big changes here, but this is a business that, you know, is heading for the rocks, but it can be turned. It's some difficult decisions. And I find sometimes people take too long to take decisions, you know. Um, and, you know, it is important, I think, you know, when we think about failure. So there's failure where you absolutely hit that point. It happens. So what you do is if at first you don't succeed, Try, try, try again. That's an old-fashioned thing that I think my dad told me when I was um, younger. 
And sometimes failure can definitely be avoided because I've definitely worked in businesses. You know, um, I was brought into a business, well, one I wanted to do, a friend, uh, some people I knew, and I managed to turn it around, but it was heading straight for the rocks. But it just needed some pretty dramatic changes, which were painful. But the net, the final result was uh, was a good result, and the business was sold. Um, um, business called My Drive sold to the AA, um, which is a which is a great success. So that's that's good news. Good coming to Japan. So Japan talk about or the Japanese are very good on kaizen, continuous improvement, and you're talking about every day is a learning day for you. Mm. So what were the lessons that you learn over in Japan? And excuse my dogs, I'm going to put you on mute. <laughs> answer that um yeah look japan i mean i went to japan in the um uh, 1984 was the first time joined this japanese electronics come 85 so actually i think now 85 and i think of 2022 wow it's 37 years ago and japan was still in, in a phase if we think about world war ii i know it's 1945 it's a hell of a long time ago but the Japanese suffered um, considerably, as the Germans did, and many other nations around the world. We and Russia, everyone suffered from World War II. The Japanese was interesting, you know. Here's a, a country that was the victim of two atomic bombs and um, terrible devastation. But the Japanese, um, the thing that impressed me, the first thing was, I didn't go there with any thinking. Um, the, the first thing for me was that, I found the Japanese incredibly polite, incredibly hardworking people. And there was a de determination there to make um, Japan a successful business. And I think the interesting thing about the industry that I worked in, the electronics industry, you know, the Japanese were developing at huge pace. So J Japanese were very well known um, in the electronics industry for quality. And what really impressed me was quality. I talked about hard work to you. When I first went to Japan, the Japanese were still predominantly working six days a week, which was part of their coming out of where they were in World War II, um, at the end of World War II. And, and the Japanese were working very hard, six days a week, as I said. Um, their attention to detail and quality is second to none. It's a bit like Apple. One of the reasons we like Apple today, it's a great product. It's very expensive. I don't know what phones everyone out there has in their hand right now. You know, I've got one of these iPhone 13 Pros. Um, and, and of course, you know, it's hugely expensive, but it is a great product. I'm looking at you through a MacBook Pro right now. Again, it's a great product. So the Japanese, what I learned from the Japanese was attention to detail, high quality products, and also leading edge products. And um, in many technologies, uh, the Japanese were uh, streets ahead of everybody else. Now, okay. Um, that's changed since then because obviously now we've seen, you know, I, I witnessed in my time a move production. You know, I remember we started moving production away from Japan on some of our entry level products because of the cost of manufacture. You know, Japanese economy getting stronger, stronger. There was a time when you got 600, you know, 600 yen to um, a pound. Um, now, you know, it, it's, it's a fraction of that. And um, so making in Japan is very expensive, but Japan um, still is a very successful company in, in terms of leading edge products, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think what I got from Japan was really nice people, hardworking again, attention to detail, quality, um, also politeness. I used to walk around Tokyo at night. And um, what I like about the Japanese is and I hope um, this won't offend anybody, but Japanese, when they have a, a drink, probably not as strong as um, Western people in terms of handling alcohol. But what I love about the Japanese, if they have a few to drink, you know what? They just become nicer. And, and you can go out, get a bit drunk, say a few silly things. It's fine. Next day, you're back at work. And that's the main focus. You go back to work and you work. And, um, and I used to find that good. And I could walk around Tokyo at night as a Westerner, I felt totally safe, probably safer at the time than walking around New York for certain um, or many other capitals around the world. Japan was was that way. So I've got great affection for the Japanese. I worked with them for 18 years, um, an honor, an honor. But I've got affection from 
from all kinds of um, people from around the world anywhere, because I've been fortunate to work with a, a lot of different people. Um, but Japanese have always got a special place for me. Great, great people. Lovely. Thank you. So you touched on before about um, where we are in the economy and maybe where we're going. There's going to be some people that are watching this that have never experienced um, what we may go through or we're starting to see with uh, interest rates rising, um, costs of gas and um, electricity. Um, you and I discussed a week or so ago that actually potentially it's an opportunity. So again, um, for people that are watching, the people that haven't been through this before, please can you share your um, experience of, you know, what you can do to create these opportunities? Yeah, look, I mean, the first thing out there is this is a very difficult time for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, what I want to say to people is this, that, you know, you look at COVID, monkeypox, you look at... Um, drought you look at interest rates going up you look at what's been happening in ukraine etc 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 and it, it it's almost a bit like a perfect storm but what i want to say to people i'm old enough to remember a drought in 1976 and i remember you know at the time i remember our house the garden my parents had a nice house actually we had a nice garden but i remember the garden had great big cracks in it and i remember we had to have part of our house underpinned um, because there was a danger of it maybe slipping. Um, this was not a good time. The government appointed a minister of drought. Um, the good news was they appointed, uh, I think it was a him, yeah, him, and um, guess what? The heavens opened. So, um, you know, and I think this morning now the, the media would have you believe it's floods and more doom coming. Um, so, look, you know, interest rates. Um, I bought my first house in 1980. I borrowed just over 25,000. The Leeds Building Society charged me an extra percent which makes sense because if you're borrowing more money, you're at greater risk. Yeah, would make sense to me. If I'm lending money, the more you borrow off me, the more I'm going to charge you. Uh, we've never had that really. We've had these kind of, you know, um, interest rates and everyone getting the same, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, you know, but my first house, it was 16 and a half percent. Now, okay, of course, I told you my house was 25 grand, but uh, sorry, 20, just over 25 grand, but my point, I think it was 27,500, but my point being, I can promise you my son it was a lot different and it was a brand new house i remember the garden was mud uh, they didn't they didn't put lawns down in those days and i remember just going to work i couldn't afford i could just about afford the mortgage so the the garden stayed as mud and i just had a fitted wardrobe so i could hang my suits up and the rest of the house was empty concrete floor downstairs so what i want to say is that you know high interest rates sadly what's happened is interest rates have done this my son has a five-year fixed rate of 0.89%. I personally would never have allowed interest rates to go so low because the lower the interest rate, the more that people just spend and borrow. Um, and, and I'd love to have another chance to talk about that on another occasion. But we are going to have higher interest rates. When we budget, we have to think about that we have to do those what ifs back to the lovely spreadsheets that we have today. And we have to think through, if we are borrowing money, what the impact of that is. Um, but you know what? What I want to say to people is that problem equals opportunity or challenge equals opportunity. So there are so many businesses out there that are challenged by current events. And as a result, they're looking for solutions in order to protect their businesses, to make sure that those businesses evolve and that those businesses grow in the future. Because Whatever happens, um, sadly, there's going to be failures. Any recession will be that some businesses won't work. Even in great times, businesses fail. But you know what? There will be businesses that will come out of this. They will come out stronger. I'm a great believer that as humans, we will sort out these problems. It is not good, the conflict that's going around in the world. It's not good having problems with energy, et cetera, et cetera. And the human race has to work together and has to um, resolve those issues. And I believe we will. And what will happen is that businesses that navigate the choppy waters now on the basis that we do come out the other side, and we have to think that way, no point thinking Armageddon. We've got to think of coming out of it. COVID, look at COVID, what that did to people. Um, but many businesses have come out the other side. Well, I've been lucky to work with some businesses that actually benefited from COVID because they did things and, and took up advantage of how people 
changed their working patterns and um, how we navigated that particular um, pandemic, which I know still hasn't gone away. Um, I want to say this to you guys. Look, problem is opportunity. So there will be lots of opportunities out there. That's good for the startup world. For existing businesses or businesses that are already on their way, again, it's about thinking what those things mean. Uh, do you need to make changes to your products and services in order to navigate those things? And, of course, you know, some caution and, and, and forward planning. But, but I think there's opportunities out there personally. But I do appreciate it's, there's, it's very um, challenging for many people. But, look, you know, you've got to work the problem and put more effort into it to come out the other side. OK, I'm very conscious of time. So thank you. So a couple of final questions, if that's OK. Sure. Um, you talked about lad, lad Bible and the uh, hardworking young young gentleman who um, started the business. Um, and one of the things that I think you said to me again off air was that they were sponges. They were just willing to learn. So again, for people listening and watching this, um, how do people, you know, do you have that, that you become a sponge or is that, can you learn it? Can you acquire it? Or you just, you're just born with it? I mean, look, some people are born with certain things. It's natural, isn't it? You look at, uh, I don't know, George Press as a footballer, you know, um, and again, through to Harry Kane or whatever today. You know, some people just are born with a natural thing. But, you know, the Lab Bible thing is a great story because, you know, the two founders, um, best of friends, went to grammar school together, went to separate unis. Um, the founder started the business while at uni. Co-founder joined him. Um, when I met them, they were 22 years of age. Um, they had this huge following on... Um, on Facebook. It was interesting because they started the business with a mobile phone. That's it, because they had a Facebook account. That, you know, and so everyone's got, well, obviously, the world's moved on now, Snapchat, TikTok, etc. But at the time, you know, most young people had a mobile device. Most young people had a Facebook account. And uh, they built up a huge following uh, with their with their content on, uh, on Facebook. And um, they were disruptive in what, what they did. But what was interesting they're from Manchester, and uh, there was a competitor called Unilad. So you've got Lad Bible and Unilad. Unilad, also from Manchester. A lot of rivalry between the two. But what impressed me when I met the founder of Lad Bible, he approached me, actually, which was interesting. Um, and I knew Lad Bible because my daughter was, um, was a follower of Lad Bible and was showing it to me. And it was so funny and entertaining that I decided to follow it. So I actually did know... Lab Bible when they approached me in 2014, eight years ago. Um, but I think the interesting thing about Lab Bible is they were very keen. The founder in particular was very keen to meet uh, people with um, experience and proven experience. A lot of people out there can talk certain things, but maybe they haven't actually done it. But he was really good at uh, reaching out to all kinds of people to find out what was the best way to take um, a business that was growing rapidly in terms of audience, but build a proper professional business. And the sponge element of the founder and the co-founder is they were really keen to learn uh, from other people. And um, you, know, you fast forward today, Unilad went back fast. Um, you know, how sad, because it was a, a Facebook page with 35 million followers. You could almost put a guinea pig in charge, it would make money, but it failed. Um, and... The difference with Lad Bible and Union Lad was Lad Bible had a very strong leadership team. Um, I don't want to make my head too big, but you've got people like myself, experienced. I worked in the cockpit with the guys, and they sucked out from my brain all of the experiences that, 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 that I had, and that allowed us to make much better decisions. They're the ones that take all the credit because they had the idea, they had the infusion, passion. They knew exactly what to do. But let's say, you know, things like recruiting people, you know, as you get older, you know, I mean, I've interviewed and recruited thousands of people. You know, when you're 22, you haven't recruited many people. So how to avoid mistakes on recruitment, how to get the right people, how to pay people, performance related um, pay, share options, get all these different things. When you're very young, you don't know them. I thought I knew a lot when I was 22. But even now in my early 60s, I, you know, I'm still learning. So. Um, and the more you learn, you avoid the bad mistakes, you, 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 you 
take on board the good things. So I think Lab Bible take a huge credit in their 20s. They're now 30s, but they they were very smart to learn from a number of people, and, and that gave them an edge, in my, my opinion. So, But you need to be prepared to do that. I need to say to you that some people, you know, they hear, but they don't listen. And so I, I don't work with people who just want to hear because that's pointless. You know, I say what I think and then they think something else, you know. So I could go back to my sister, you know, my sister might, you know, I might talk to her a little bit about things that I've done and the hours that I work, but it wouldn't change. She'd still work. And again, I'm not saying she's wrong, by the way. I'm just saying, but it, it, it wouldn't be a one plus one is three. It would be a one plus one is less than one. <laughs> so how do you get people then to um, implement your ideas? Or, you know, because you get a load of people that come on courses whatever it is, they listen, um, I call it either self-development or shelf development, they come back and all their notes go on the shelf, whereas you get the exceptional people that were self-developed, they're happily, they try and implement it. But how do you action that implementation and that accountability and should there be consequences or for people that don't implement? And there well, is no first one the job i'm doing it's not about do this do that it's often have you thought about this have you thought about that but sometimes it can be i guess it's like being a parent you know and i'm just thinking of my daughter i mean when she was born you know i certainly would not let her put her hand under a scalding hot tap but would i let her walk outside and fall over sure because we have to we've got to learn that so so fortunately you know most decisions are not life-threatening you know so most decisions are more about guidance and certainly with my daughter now you know probably doesn't listen very much to me now which is fine because you know she's a young adult has her own ideas and, and develops herself and i think lab bible now i think they still listen to people definitely but but they're, they're much more experienced now so they can leverage that knowledge and experience that they've got with their own business but, but you know i don't think it's about like i said i don't think it's about do this do that i think getting you know, the, the most important thing is to sometimes look at the options, you know, um, you're trying to make a decision and to maybe break it down into the various options. Of course, of course, I want to have my say as, you know, if you want my opinion, I think the best option is this. But sometimes I've worked with people and said, look, let's 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 try it your way. Let's let's go that way. I will support it 100 percent. And because when you're not sure on something, let's say you and I are working on something and you know, and you've got to implement it, it it's probably best we, we go with your way. But we have to make a deal that says if it doesn't work, you know, can we at least try the other option, you know, um, and then give it the same enthusiasm as we give option A. And it's not about you were right, you were wrong. What it, what it is about is that in the end, okay, maybe option A didn't work, but option B did. Or maybe option A worked first time, which is great because we're all, we're all stakeholders. Um, and you know it doesn't really matter who furnishes the idea uh what matters is trying to get the right idea as, as quickly as possible because yeah we don't want to make 10 decisions and they're all not the right ones you know but sometimes it takes a, a few attempts to get a, a decision optimized let's say and and correct for the business and there's no one size fits all because every business is different but i think you know, I think it's implementation with passion and conviction. And I'm, I think over the years I've learned more about kind of, I'm thinking go right, but we go left. I remember park at my house, there was a decision made to change the brand name. Um, so originally we were, people were parking in people's driveways and we're growing and they're parking in churches and, um, they're parking in social clubs and so on and so on. And then, you know, as our audience grew, suddenly we started adding car parks to our list because, you know, in London there were, after congestion charge, you know, parking, the number of people driving changed, car parks weren't so busy, car parks were empty at weekends. So, you know, they, they, they approached us. So suddenly we, we, we were more than just park at the house. It's a bit like car phone warehouse, I guess. You know, car phone warehouse was back to the days. Now, you can keep a brand. And keep it forever but the decision was we debated should we change to just park the business that we have today just park and i actually voted against which was the wrong decision 
Wright decision, which was the founder and um, um, the uh, CEO, I can't remember his exact title, but the number two guy, sorry, um, Alex, if you're listening, but they, they went with just part, absolutely the right decision. And, um, you know, so it wasn't about I was wrong, you were right. It was actually we made the right decision the first time. Um, and Just Park is a, is a successful business. And um, unfortunately, that was a good call. So, so yeah, I can promise you I'm human and all humans make, I don't want to say a mistake because, you know, I just want to say that it was a great call to, to rebrand. Never easy to change a brand name. And I've had one recently with a business that I'm involved in um, where we've rebranded. And again, I'm always nervous on rebrands, but we've rebranded. And again, it's the right decision to rebrand. Even Lad Bible, we were the Lad Bible, and I was nervous about changing it to Lad Bible. But again, the mark, the uh, the CMO had a very compelling reason to just go Lad Bible, and he, he was right. You know, so um, yeah, there you go. Well, well, I could carry this carry this on all day because there's so many things that you, know, you sharing and the insights and the tips, and it's it's phenomenal. And for me, it's just learning and success leaves clues. And obviously, you've got. A, so far and i know there's more to go an incredible career just one final question okay from your point of view any books podcasts that you recommend that um people watching or listening um should should go and read or listen to oh this is a weak side of me i, I think i once said to felix dennis you know um i think he said have you read my book when i first met him um it was um how to get rich i think Felix Dennis, founder of Dennis Publishing, sadly um, passed away from cancer, but I had the honour of working with him closely uh, and his leadership team. Um, but I remember when he said to me, have you read my book? I said, have you read mine? He was, what? <laughs> I said, well, actually, I haven't written the book. But I said, I've got to be honest with you, I'd, ra I'd probably rather write a book than read one. But I, I do read the odd book. I reread Steve Jobs' autobiography the other day. Uh, not sorry, not autobiography, but the, the, the biography of Steve Jobs. And um, I read that when it first came out after his death, and I read that again. Um, and that was quite fascinating. It, it went beyond business for me. It was a bit kind of personal because I think, you know, if you look at Steve Jobs, his life, I think there were aspects of his life that for all the adulation, for all the money, you know, um, you know, very sadly, he passed away. And um, and I think when you look at the personal side, so I think sometimes if I read, I quite like reading, you know, I, I enjoy hearing about people's journeys and what they've done. And also the, you know, I, it's not all positive, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm a really positive person and, and I've been incredibly lucky. But I think, you know, come the day I analyse it all, there'll definitely be things that, you know, you sometimes give up things um, in the pursuit of, um, you know, back to being an entrepreneur. You know, it, it's tough and it, it, it's a lot of pressure on people and it affects other people around you. Um, and I think for Jobs, you know, um, his, you know, his his daughter, Lisa, and I mentioned the Apple Lisa too, didn't I? But at the time, you know, Steve Jobs did not accept that uh, Lisa was his daughter, you know, and that's, this is quite personal, and I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say this to you. I'm not going to recommend an individual book because or certain things. It's good. It's good to listen to people. So um, I don't want to say that don't listen, don't read. Quite the opposite. I just think for me, time has always been a a problem, and I think I tend to read on a plane. I do have holidays now, so um, I had a holiday in May, and I did read that book all 660 odd pages of it and it was it was it was fascinating but uh, not the perfect answer to your question there readers or um <laughs> to, to your audience rather but uh, yeah probably the one i can't answer the best okay well i'm incredibly grateful for your time thank you so much for sharing your journey with everybody this morning um and sharing your learnings it's been a real pleasure so thank you very much um thank you everybody for watching and listening I'm incredibly grateful. Jim, good morning. So thank you. And for everybody else watching live, incredibly grateful for you coming on this morning. Have a great Tuesday, everybody. And I look forward to catching up with you soon. And Hugh, thank you so much for being a phenomenal guest. Incredibly grateful. It's very kind of you. Thank you for inviting me. I hope uh, out there, if 
if people have got something from this, that, that will make my time worthwhile. Any burning questions, fire them to Stephen, and, and I promise you I'll answer them. Okay, brilliant. Chris, thank you so much for watching. So thank you all. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.